Um, today, I just I wanted to give a, a little presentation today on um, forecasting a lake ice out in, in Minnesota, and it's something that we've been working on for kind of a long time. Um, and uh, and basically, um, the reason I want to do this is, um, I'm being facetious here, but I'd like to help you cheat on your local ice out pool, because I find the more I talk about ice out, the more I know people are putting money on what the, uh, the, the date of ice out is going to be. From my standpoint, the reason I like to work on this is because I want to know when I can put my boat in, get the docks in, get out there on the water again after a, a, a long and, and in our case, super snowy winter. So, um, so uh, we've been doing quite a bit of work on this over over the last um, year or so, and and so thought we'd bring some results to you all. And um, and I just wanted to thank you all for for being here and uh, to be with us and hear about this. And um, I can be uh, reached anytime at downing at umn.edu. I wanted also to thank um, Bill Grantus and Jan Sandberg of the Itasca Waters Board. And Bill is also uh, AIS coordinator with the Soil and Water Conservation District. And, and, and Jan is um, basically drives the Itasca uh, Waters Board. And so as such, this, is, um, this program is co-sponsored by Itasca Waters, itascawaters.org. Um, a couple of housekeeping tips before we get going. Microphones and cameras are set to off by Zoom because this is a webinar format, and we're going to have recording on for this session. And if you have questions as we go along, be sure to write them in the Q&A located at the bottom of the screen. Um, and um, that um, because we're not using the chat, we're using the Q&A section. And Jan and Bill are going to be running the uh, Q and A session for me, and keeping track of of questions as they come in, and um, and you also might want to note that all of the Sea Grant links that I'm going to give you will start with z.umn.edu/slash, and then some kind of simple word, so you don't have to um, scribble scribble these down very fast if you want to link to them. And the slides and video are going to be available on the Sea Grant .umn.edu site as soon as possible, and you can get to that from the uh, same links as you do for the water widget, our water uh, ice out widget. So first, before we get going, I thought we ought to talk a little about Minnesota Sea Grant, what we do, because some of you may not know what that is. We're sort of like land grant and space grant. We are sponsored by a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the University of Minnesota. And as such, we are a system-wide program um, we serve Minnesotans who need water science and get that get the science to them in a way they can use it. And we serve business, industry, government, policymakers, youth, educators, citizens, community organizations, agencies, cities, um, and um, and uh, uh, managers, and just virtually everybody in Minnesota. And if the science doesn't exist, then we fund that science, get it built for people, and get it back into their hands. If it has to do with water, then we are involved in it. Um, first, I'm supposed to give a little disclaimer. This webinar is, and widget are not going to tell you when the ice is safe or not safe. It's only what we're working on so far is trying to figure out when the ice will be off the lakes. Um, and if you're interested, um, if you'd like to know more about ice formation and safety on ice, you could um, go to the link that I've provided on the screen, basically z.umn.edu slash lake ice. It'll tell you more about this. And if you don't read that and you get out on the ice um, and get in trouble, you could also read about hypothermia um, at the shiver link that I've given you on the screen. So same same link, but just with the word shiver. So today what I want to do is tell you a little bit about what we're learning about Minnesota ice out. Um, and I'll start by saying why we care about this. I'm If you are in this webinar, then you probably care. Um, and then um, I'm going to tell you how this all works. I'll maybe do a little demonstration if we have time. And then I'll give you an ice out forecast for the popular northern Minnesota lakes. And I'll also talk about variation across the state and ice out dates. And then we'll go into Q&A and, and Bill and Jan will help me through that and keep track of questions. And I'll give you the best answers I can. So why do we care? Um, so uh, when I was a kid, in Minnesota, growing up um, on the lakes in northern Minnesota, um, ice out basically was May 1st, plus or minus a week, and you could kind of count on that. 
isn't so much true anymore. And and I always call it climate weirdness. Climate seems to have gotten, or at least weather weirdness, um, it seems to have gotten really strange. And there's um, a whole lot of variation in when things happen in terms of phenology. So this matters to a really uh, to a lot of people. I mean, well, now we're finding that um, early ice out or late ice out can subtract seven weeks from the open water season. And um, this means that a lot of people, uh, it means a lot to people and to businesses who rely on tourism income or income from seasonal residents and a bunch of other people too. And as I said before, I care about it because I want to get my boat in the water. But stretching or compressing the open water season makes a huge difference. Um, and that is essentially about something like 50 plus or minus seven weeks gives us maybe, um, you know, somewhere between 25 and 50 percent of the summer season in, in boatable length. The boating industry in Minnesota is worth a lot of money. Uh, people spend a billion in boat sales annually, and it supports 11,000 jobs and a whole lot of marine businesses. And also just helping hospitality industry plan is really important, plus or minus a few weeks in um, in resorts, motels, camping, restaurants, and rental homes, and so on, means a lot of uh, difference in income. And also, I, I, I worry about law enforcement planning. Um, any of you who've driven on Highway 35 coming north on a... Um, on a Friday in, in the summer, know what traffic is like. And also we have issues about marine patrols if we have people on the water. Um, opening cab cabins and cottages, do we open them earlier? Are we gonna be closing them later? Um, my family's um, summer season was basically Memorial Day to Labor Day and isn't anymore because of changes in weather. Um, also, it means a lot of, it makes a lot of difference. So sporting goods and camping gear industries and also bait eventually. I mean, of course, because of, of opener and so on. So it's really important to other people in an economic sense, but um, many of us just would like to get out on the lakes. So ice out date varies really a lot. And here are two pictures on your screen that show the same day in two different years, 2016, um, relatively but not extremely early ice out date. And on the right-hand side, you see um, at 2023, I, uh, this is actually the 12th of March, an image taken at the same place. And there's a huge difference in um, ice conditions and um, and um, melt and thaw in um, uh, among years. Um, so I thought I'd show you, if I can, and we'll see if this all works, I wanna show you a little vi video um, that's a time-lapse video showing ice out uh, in a particular year. And um, you can just follow along and see how the weather changes and also it changes the ice conditions as ice leaves. This is only 48 seconds long, so um, not time enough to get popcorn. But here we go. Let's see if she'll work for us. Hold on. And this was a lake uh, done on a lake in Itasca County. And you can see that snow is disappearing fast. The dates down at the bottom, it's a little crooked because I had to adjust that. We're at the 24th of March. And you can see it's beginning to create a, a lead, a shore lead, uh, open water around the edge. And then that um, shore lead freezes and breaks. And then as soon as you get, uh, and then we've got some colder weather, a little bit more snow, um, it refreezes. But as soon as you get an open shore lead, then the entire ice sheet can move back and forth and begin to crack up, break, and wind will take out the ice. So it goes pretty fast for now in this particular year on the 8th of April. Um, so it goes quickly when it happens. And um, it's a particular process that can be sped and slowed by weather conditions, particularly the accumulation of heat in the atmosphere. So. I thought first to look at what the range now is of ice out dates in north central Minnesota lakes. And you'll see a list of them in the second bullet there. Um, and I, I'm sorry if your favorite big biggish lake isn't there. Um, we're expanding the database and we'll try to make this even a, a bigger database. But there is a link where you can go and look at the ice out data for all the lakes in Minnesota for which DNR keeps data uh, keeps the data. And I'll show you an image of that in just a little bit. But to save complication, I concentrated on a few large popular lakes in North Central using data since 1963. So, you know, roughly 60 years worth of data from, from deer, um, gull, 
of Jesse, Leach, Malak, Pelican, Pokegama, uh, Sisabakwit, Split Hands, Swan, Trout, uh, the one near Coleraine, and the also also the one in the Wabana chain, Wabana, Whitefish, and Winnie. Um, and so, um, and then we also, I'll be showing you some weather data as we go along. And um, these weather data are from the National Weather Service and the Duluth office. And I'd like to express my thanks to Joe Moore of the um, NWS uh, office in Duluth for helping us figure out how to get this together. And then the data calculations and widgets, a widget that you're going to see in a bit was created by Minnesota Sea Grants, Jane Reed. And um, um, and she and, and she's as, as keen on these kinds of data, I think, as I am. So um, that was really helpful. But it allows people to track the accumulation of heat uh, from January 1st to see how likely ice out is becoming for any given year. So here's the range of ice out dates for these north central Minnesota lakes. And uh, in the center, that green, lightish green line shows you sort of the 50% point. Um, and the 50% um, of ice out over the last, oh, 40, 60, 40 to 60 years, depending on the lake, has been about April 24th. But the interesting thing is it's blurring out on the tails of that curve out to the left and to the right so that uh, ice out can be two thirds to three quarters of the way uh, through May uh, in, a, in a really cold year, or it can be as early as late March uh, with some average, some early April dates showing up. And so I use a lot of day of year um, calculations because it's easier to put into mathematics. So you'll often see day of year, uh, 120 is about the 1st of May and 90 is about the 1st of April, just for reference. But the median ice out date on those lakes that I'm talking about has been about April um, April 24th. So ice out though, you know, just a caveat to all this, ice out can vary by two months across Minnesota. And there's a link at the bottom of this page and it'll be on the slides that will be available on the Minnesota Sea Grant um, uh, website. Um, but you can link to this and look at the how ice out varies across the lake and uh, across the state. And ice out starts uh, is earliest down in the southeast and latest up in the northeast of Minnesota. And it can vary by a couple of months. So what I'm talking about are those pinkish purpley lakes uh, in this talk. But I'm also going to give some tools to you if you happen to live in the southern half of the state to use to sort of track um, attract, um, the potential for ice out in a given year. So we've had some pretty extreme ice out years in northern Minnesota lakes. And uh, the earliest have been um, are listed on the left in sort of the with the earliest first. 2012 was an early ice out year. And then Weirdly enough, the next year, 2013, was one of the latest ice out years. So we're getting a lot of variation. I've only listed about seven for each of the earliest and latest years, just to give you an idea. And you can probably think back in your own memories about um, what those years were like. So um, 2012, 2010, 2000, you know, a, a kind of a pattern emerges here in that the 2000s, in the last 20 years, have shown a lot of pretty early ice outs, whereas a lot of the late ice outs happened somewhere in the past. Not all, of course, 2022 um, was um, nearly a record. And I think in some of our lakes, um, ice was not out even before uh, fishing opener. So we've had some extremes. So there are lots of things that can cause lake ice to melt faster or slower. And I've given a rabbit here and a turtle to give you some sense of speed. Number one in the list is the high, high temperature and amount of sun and accumulating heat in the atmosphere. And we'll come back, uh, we'll come back to that in just a little. This is one of the principal drivers. It doesn't matter really how thick the ice or deep the snow. If you don't have heat, you're not going to melt out the ice. So heat is a principal driver of ice out. Also, deep snow tends to slow down ice out. Thick ice in the very cold years, you know, ice thickens on the bottom. So um, thick ice, uh, um, it, it takes a little bit longer to melt. Um, and if the temperature in the fall, the autumn, is high, that will tend to speed the overall ice out because 
um, because there's more residual heat available and um, less water to um, uh, less water to uh, that less heat needs to be put in to warm warm the lake enough to um, melt the ice. Wind is also a factor, but warm wind. So this will be spring winds are important and they tend to speed ice out. The size of the lake, bigger lakes are slower to melt. And oftentimes um, that's linked to streams and runoff because the little lakes take a bigger proportion of runoff. That runoff carries a lot of heat as does rain and that can melt out the ice quicker. So rain carries heat, speeds up ice melt, streams and runoff a speed ice melt as well. So um, we measure heat and thawing potential in a slightly different way than you may be used to. Um, meteorologists use cumulative heat to measure melting or thawing potential. And this is expressed as a kind of a confusing sounding term and it's thawing degree days. And, and you'll see it uh, um, abbreviated as TDD. And um, what we do is we sum the amount of cumulative heat over the, um, over the period from January 1st, um, day by day, and um, until ice out to see how the um, uh, the heat is accumulating and how the thawing potential has accumulated. And there's a, a little demonstration of how we calculate the, the TDD or thawing degree days for a, a single day. You take the daily high temp plus the daily low temperature, you divide it by two and you subtract 32. And that will give you the, the thaw degree days for that particular day. And if it, of course, if it's not thawing, then um, if that number will get to be zero, and if it's zero, then we just set it to zero. Um, it's not thawing. So here's an example, high of 50, low of 32, the sum is 82. This is a lot of math, sorry. Divide by two, get, you get 41. You take 32 away from 41, and um, you get um, nine thawing degree days. And then you sum those for each day, uh, over the time from January 1st um, through the spring, and it will give you some estimate of what the thawing potential is um, in, in any given year. So you all know this anyway, and here's a demonstration. This is why temperature and time are important in melting lakes. lakes. On the left, you see an ice cube that's been out of the freezer for 10 minutes. On the right, you see one that's been out of the freezer for an hour. Um, so time and temperature matter. These were at room temp for different periods of time. And obviously the longer you go at higher temperature, the quicker you can melt that ice. And the same is true for lakes. So it's, the seasons are really, have really been different. And so I calculated the heating potential for our lakes um, over about 60 years of data taken from the National Weather Service from, um, in this case, from the uh, Hibbing Airport, the Range Regional Airport, uh, because that's where um, good data that are relevant to these particular lakes are, are collected. And um, if you can see this pointer on the screen, um, and I'm not sure you can, but if, if um, over to the left of this red line, this is where we are today. This is our day number here uh, at the bottom of that arrow. And we actually on this date have zero thawing degree days. So we're actually at zero underneath this graph um, on this particular plot. And I think if you look at the left-hand side, you can see there are lots of years where we start to accumulate a lot of heat early on in the winter time. Uh, way back, even in January and February, we're beginning to build heating or thawing potential. And those lakes, of course, that are getting that big heat input are going to thaw the quickest. So the red arrow tells us where we are today. And these are just for the uh, Range Regional Airport because it's the closest to a lot of the lakes that I've been looking at recently in sort of North Central, um, uh, North Central Minnesota. So lots of variation between years in the amount of, uh, in the heating trajectory, how fast the winter and spring heat up. So I also wanted to ask how much cumulative spring warming it takes to melt lakes. And the answer is always, well, it depends. But the, the overall answer is you need enough heat. So this graph on the right shows the uh, uh, 
cumulative probability of ice out in all those lakes I showed you earlier, plot, you know, graphed up against the thaw degree days at ice out from that, um, the range regional airport. And I think I'm hoping what you can see is at about 50% uh, probability, um, you're hitting about 220 thawing degree days. And that 220 number is important. That means that once our widget and um, the cumulative um, uh, cumulative spring warming uh, hits about 220 thawing degree days, we have a 50-50 chance that the lakes are going to be free of ice. So um, lakes are almost never thawed at under 75 thawing degree days. About 10% of them are ice-free at um, in, in, in a, well, in about 10% of the lake years, they're 10, um, they're ice-free at about 150 thaw degree days, 50% at 220, and basically all of them are ice-free at about 300. So this is why it's important for us to be tracking if you're interested in projecting when the lakes are going to be free of ice, it's important to track thawing degree days or that cumulative heat through the winter. Cumulative heat drives ice out. The red arrow is where we are today. The green arrow is that 220 thawing degree days. And you can see the spread in day numbers uh, across that green line. Um, and this it reflects how early or how late um, thawing of the lakes or ice out will occur. So it makes a big difference how much um, thawing potential we have. So that's why Jane uh, Reed worked hard to build us this widget so that we could, National Weather Service doesn't give you these kinds of data, but Minnesota Sea Grant does now because we would like to be able to track how um, likely it is that ice is going to be lost on lakes. And this can work across the state. And those um, numbers are uh, those rules of thumb with, regret, uh, with respect to thawing degree days will work for um, lakes, I think, pretty much across the state, but they were built from lakes in North Central. So you can watch this widget uh, for your region and choose the closest airport to your favorite lake. And um, and if I guess uh, what I'll do is demo this for you um, at the end if we have uh, enough time. I don't want to eat up too much of your day. But basically, if you will go to this widget link, um, you will see a map of Minnesota that looks like this. Um, and it has a bunch of airports on it, and you can choose the airport nearest your lake and click on it, and then it will list that airport down in the location um, a location um, box down at the bottom, and then you can click on Get Data, and then it will show you um, the thawing degree days that have accumulated this winter since January 1st. And when I made this graph, I... Uh, or made this uh, image, it was zero thawing degree days. It's still zero thawing degree days um, on this particular day. So that's what this widget um, what this widget will do for us. And it just allows us to track and say how likely how likely it is that we've had a warm winter or we've had a cold winter, and how will that affect lake ice out. And next, I'm going to show you some a little bit of statistics and um, and um, I'm sorry about that, but it's um, it's the nerdy part of this talk. Um, nerdy part is the way we make a prediction of the most likely ice out date is by taking lots and lots of data over lots of years and um, making a, a statistical relationship between the eventual, eventual ice out day number and the thaw degree days on this particular day, March 15, and it gives us a, a, an equation that allows us to make a projection out into the future. And as I'll talk about in a minute, you know, foretelling the future is a complicated affair, but this is the average, will give us the average case. And of course, um, these relationships get stronger. We have one for each day uh, as we get closer. And I'll update this in our, um, update the forecast in our um, April newsletter, Minnesota Sea Grant. But um, uh, um, uh, and and they get stronger as we get closer and closer to ice out. So um, so today the thawing degree days from January one is zero, um, and today's model forecasts a mean ice out 
on day 119 for Northern Lakes, and that would be April 29th. Um, and I'll come around to that in a second because I'm going to modify that prediction just a, a little bit. But that would be the overall statistical forecast for ice out date. So I'm sorry to tell you that this is not going to be a year. It's very unlikely this would be a year with early ice out. We just haven't had any heat. So it is also statistically pretty hard to pick a date when there's been no thawing in 2022 to 2023. And we know that all those other things have an effect on, um, uh, on ice out um, in our lakes. Um, but uh, if you take all of the lakes that have, that had zero thaw, all the lakes and years that had thawing degree days of zero on March 15, you come up with an average value of just about the 20, uh, uh, just about the, um, I think the 21st, 20, uh, sorry, the 1st of May, just basically the middle of this graph, this um, this bar graph is about the 1st of May. So um, the statistics, the other statistics say 29 April, this one says 1st of May for ice out. Now we know that all those other things have an effect, snow depth, and uh, gee, I wonder if you've had any snow at your house. Um, we've had just a little bit. Ice thickness is probably a little bit thin. Uh, fall temperature wasn't super warm. But um, snow depth is something that we need to be considering, I think. So uh, the statistical forecast from today uh, out to out six weeks, basically, is day 119 to day 121 of this year, which would be April 29th to May 1st. The caveat is, though, that if it warms faster or slower than average, it will be earlier or later. And we know that deeper snow can slow ice out because it insulates um, insulates the ice against melting. Um, so depending on whether Northern Lakes may in fact be ice free before fishing opener, but I'm not sure exactly how to um, how to put a probability on this. Um, fishing opener is the 12th of uh, 12th of May this year, and um, uh, we are the overall average prediction for ice out will be. 29th of April to May 1st, um, and we've had a lot of snow. So let's look at a couple other factors that play a role. The snow depth, and this these data are a week old, and we've had so much snow in the last week in the Northland that um, we've got even more insulating layer than this. We've got a very big snowpack, and that insulates the lakes against, um, against thawing. Um, and also, if you look at the National Weather Service's three to four, um, three to four week temperature outlook, um, all the projections seem to be have us at below normal um, temperatures for uh, all of Minnesota and particularly the um, the Northland. So, given all that and knowing that predicting the future is hard, um, and because there's always some uncertainty. Statistics give us a forecast of 29 April to May 1. Um, and I, I think this needs a handicap, basically in golf terms of a plus, plus a week due or so due to snow and forecast cold weather. So if I have to, you know, it's always difficult to make a, a projection, a forecast that far out. Um, but I would project um, ice out in the Northland to be May 6th to May 8th, or, or plus or minus about five days. Um, which of course puts us well right about a fishing opener on the high on the on the late end. Um, could be earlier um, than that if things warm really fast, um, and it uh, could be later if things stay very very cold. And I just wanted at the end of this talk, I think this might be um, pretty much my my last my last slide, and I thank you for paying attention this long. There are a couple of things you can do to help us make better future forecasts of ice out. And I was really surprised. I have a very active lake association and um, and um, and my family has been pretty active in, in observation. But when I look at what the DNR has in their list and that uh, their list of ice out dates, um, it, our, our record is pretty spotty. I'd like to encourage you all to um, sign up with the Minnesota DNR uh, to put your ice up and ice out reporting data into their system. Right now, 
Um, if you look at this link, uh, they have a Facebook page, the Minnesota State Climatology Office, and they ask you to put your observations in that Facebook page. It, I would say that if you have big databases or if you've been paying attention to ice up, ice up and ice out data for a long period of time, if you'd like me to, you could send me those data and I'll get them into the DNR databases the best I can. And they'll take some information on where they were, where the observations were made and by whom and so on. And we can get them to DNR. The data, better the database, the stronger our forecasts are going to be. And the more we can liberate, more time for us to spend on the water. The other, because snow depth is really important, there are a couple of things you can do too in order to help us with these projections. You can join the National Weather Service's Weather Observa Observer Program. And there's a link on your screen. And again, these slides will be on the Minnesota Sea Grant site so that you can click on this and, and see how to sign up with our Weather Observer Program. And also, um, if you have a, one of these uh, automated weather stations, the National Weather Service would really like to have your weather, uh, weather station linked to their overall um, database. And that would really help with our projections. We're making predictions based on high, daily highs, daily lows at an airport that may be dozens of miles away from the lake that you're interested in. The higher resolution information on weather will really help us um, help us make better projections in the future. So that's that's what I have. I hope uh, I'm I'm sorry the dates are so late. I'm sorry particularly for me because I really would like to get my boat out on on the water earlier. Um, uh, but um, now, if you have any questions, um, Bill Granches and Jan Sandberg of the Itasca Waters Board are going to moderate the Q and A and. Uh, um, uh, Bill and Jan may combine similar questions, and we may not be able to get to everything. Um, and you can email me, as I think Bill is probably going to tell you. But I thank you for your attention, and I, I hope it made sense to you. Thanks. Thank you, John. OK, um, welcome, everybody, to the question and answer section of the program today. John, that was fantastic. Um, science can be fun. Anyway. Everybody, as John said, submit your questions in writing using the Q&A icon. Um, do not use chat. And uh, we're going to read your questions out loud. We're going to try and group similar ones together. And if we don't get to your questions, John has said, there's his email address, uh, to send him an email. So without further ado, let's begin. And our first question, <laughs> sorry, I'm chuckling because it's a friend of mine, Karen. Um, how can you take into consideration the fact that different lakes use different criteria to measure an ice out date? One example would be Shaganaw Lake. I want to win this one. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it is a big problem and DNR is aware of this and um, they do ask people to tell them how they determine the ice out date. Now different, um, uh, they also keep track though of different parts of different lakes when they are ice free. And that's also helpful. Um, so I think, you know, as, as that little time lapse video showed, mostly ice out is pretty quick. I mean, pretty punctual. It'll happen in a day. And sometimes it drags out over a couple of days. And even in DNR's database, I see different observers giving different ice out dates. And what I do with those kinds of things, what that means is um, part of the lake was probably ice-free, part wasn't ice-free, and so I'll take the average of the numbers. And it, in the grand scheme of things, plus or minus a day or two is probably not going to matter a whole lot because the, the patterns are really strong over time. But it's it's really um, important when there's no ice floating around. Um, and that, you know, that happens pretty quickly, you know, because when ice leaves, you mix the lake top to bottom and the water at the bottom is 40 degrees, enough to melt any residual ice. So um, yeah, nice question. Thank you. And um, I, the DNR asks that people tell them where and how they've determined ice out. Very good. Second question. The ice around Grand Rapids was slushy early this season and I understand finally froze poorly. How does this affect ice out? Yeah, um, 
In the lakes that I've been looking at, uh, I'm pretty sure we've got multi-layer ice right now. And that's what you'll get if you have periods of freeze and thaw. So you get slush on the top and then you'll get a refreeze. Um, generally what that means is if you've got slush, it's going to be sitting at somewhere around 32, 30, you know, 32, well, let, let's say 31 to 33 degrees, somewhere in that range, right? So it's already got a little heat in it. So the more slush you have hanging around, then the more heat you've got accumulated already in the lake. I, I have some sensors out in Wabana Lake in um, about 18 miles north of, of Grand Rapids. And I have one of those sensors at, oh, a foot and a half, a foot to foot and a half, somewhere in that range. And that water down there is already above 32 degrees. So wow. um, these, yeah, these um, the lakes will, will tend to uh, begin to thaw kind of from the bottom up as well as the top down. But that I think the slush is already, it's already holding a little bit of heat. So um, I, I, I think that will probably speed it along. And we, well, we should know that uh, the amount of snow cover definitely does affect aquatic invasive species, especially people with curly pondweed. The more snow there is, the less curly leaf you'll see in the beginning of the season. Okay. Yeah, it, it sure does cut, cut down and uh, cut down on light down there. And, but it also, Bill, just insulates that ice against thaw. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, you know, my wife and I were speaking about this, I think just this morning or last night, or, you know, that sometimes you get a buildup of of that snow around the lake, around the edges of the lake. So it's quite mm -hmm. thick. You know this because you nearly fall off your skis when you try to ski out on the lake, right? And you go into these big drifts. Um if you don't, and that stuff uh, will um, insulate the ice against thaw. Sure. Um, and, um, and if you don't get a, what's called a shore lead, that is open water around the edge, then you can't move that whole ice sheet back and forth and start busting it up, right? Mm -hmm. So right. yeah, that, that um, snow sure does have a snow thickness. I mean, that's why, you know, I, I chose the worst year ever to try and make a forecast of ice out, right? But that's kind of standard. Um, you know, because we have so much snow out there right now and its distribution is, is, is kind of wacky. You've got a lot around the edge, a lot, a lot out in the lake, not so much out 20 feet offshore, depending on your lake, of course, and the wind exposure. But yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. Appreciate okay. It. Uh, Davey asks, is there a way to see a 30 day forecast of high, low temps in the widget? Uh, no, but you can go to I I put a um, I put a link in the uh, in the slides, and you can get this from National Weather Service. And the way to do that, I mean, if you don't want to look for that link, go to weather.gov, and then click the pull down um, up at the upper left of that website. I know that website pretty well, and look for long range forecasts. And it'll give you a whole bunch of different forecasts for the United States for different areas and show you where we'll be above or below mm -hmm. um, uh, normal temps. And, um, you know, we could mess around with the statistics and, and sort of discount or add to the um, overall, um, um, overall accumulation of heat based on that. But those are also forecasts. So putting a forecast with another forecast gets messy. But I think... It's looking, you know, from everything National Weather Service is telling us right now, we're looking for substantially lower temperatures over the next, you know, four weeks or so, which mm -hmm. of course will slow um, uh, thaw. But just go to the uh, weather.gov upper left-hand corner, click um, other forecasts, and you can um, and you can get the long-range uh, weather. Very good. Chris F. asks, does lake size account for the volume of water? Worded another way, what impact does lake depth have? Yeah, I think uh, that's, that's a, a really insightful question. I appreciate that. Um, so lake size, the bigger the lake, the slower it thaws, right? I mean, because you've got a lot of ice out there to melt. Now, when it begins to break up, the lake is going to mix top to bottom, and if the if the lake is deep, then the ice is going to is going to melt out faster than if the lake is shallow because you've got all that heat stored up in the deep water. So, um, but another thing that's really important, and I was looking at 
uh, Winnie, the um, Isaac days on uh, Isaac dates on Lake Winnebagoshish, and they're kind of all over the place. Sometimes they're early, sometimes they're late. Same with Malak, and it kind of all depends on wind exposure and which way the wind is going when um, when the ice begins to thaw. And um, so, yes, heat matters and depth matters, um, and size of the lakes matter. A, a lot. The little lakes are going to thaw faster, basically because they're getting a lot of runoff that carries a lot of heat, and the and the uh, bigger lakes are going to be um, thawing more slowly. But the more wind energy they get across that ice, the faster they're going to break up. And you know, I one example I give is that you know if you've got a um, you know 10, 20 mile an hour wind blowing across the ice, and you have a chunk of ice that's maybe three yards by three yards that is a heavy oh. piece of stuff and you'll translate a lot of that speed into the ice and it will have pretty much the same power as a little bobcat does you know that oh. relatively small piece of and that's why it will plow up a lot of of the shores especially on big lakes yeah i'm, <laughs> I'm just thinking of when my uh dock steps got taken out just that the power of the ice is just amazing you know, hey, was a couple of years ago, did you see the ice, um, um, the, the amazing bulldozer effect of the ice on Malak on the oh, yeah. eastern shore uh, just a couple of years ago? That was an amazing thing. To see. National news. National yeah. news on that one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom N. Uh, asks, will Ice Inn be addressed by the widget? He's in particular yeah. looking for possible ice skating potential. Yeah. Yeah, Tom. Um uh, we're working on it. Um, we could pull together the projections for ice out because, you know, that's the period of the year we're in. But the widget also has freezing uh, freezing degree days in it. If you'll look at that little widget um, and if and if we run out of questions, I'll open it up or take that risk um, and open it up and show you. But it's pretty easy to run. Um, you choose an airport, you click and it'll give you the, the freezing degree days, but freezing degree days, we calculate from October 1st, not from January 1st, right? Because this is for icing up the lake. Um, and eventually uh, when we get the analysis done, we should be able to project ice in. The tricky bit, Tom, is um, I don't want to give anybody the false impression that ice is safe either, um, when it just because it's frozen. And um, I have a whole article I've written on this. When you and I, you know, when I drive back and forth from the Twin Cities, I'll see people with their trucks out on the ice on like Forest Lake at an incredibly early, you know, just got ice and they got a truck out there. What you're doing is you're floating your truck on the water and you're using the ice, the elasticity of the ice to hold it up. So I worry a lot about people getting out on the ice too early. So there'll be tons of disclaimers on that, but we should be able to make some pretty good uh, forecasts of, of lake ice up. Yeah, driving up get you out on those skates get you out on those skates tom absolutely okay um another question comes in if there is a really cold winter does ice go out slower even if the weather warms faster yes uh, that's a simple answer and um and we don't have that in the current models but i have done some work on that and it is not as important as heating but the amount of accumulated cold in the winter and the thickening of the ice does have a significant effect. So it will go out more slowly. And you noticed in the graph, which is you know uh, a, a wild wild graph, I mean trying to project many weeks out in advance, there was a lot of variation, and some of that I think has to do with ice thickness, some has to do with snow depth, mm. and um, some has to do with windiness and a bunch of other stuff. But yes, it's it will have an effect. It's a lot of accumulated cold in the water that you need to melt. Okay, well, another question here is, are all parts of the state subject to the same extremes and ice out dates as Northern Minnesota? You know, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question because I haven't analyzed all the data. We could sure do it. Um, I don't know if the variation in Southern Minnesota has increased. Now, down at the southeastern corner um, of the state, 
the airports down there have seen something like 60 to 75 um, thaw degree days already down in the southeastern part. So clearly they are looking at a much more rapid ice out than the northern part of the state. Um, you know, I, I don't know the answer, but also go on that DNR site that, that the link is given in the slides, go on the DNR ice out site and or you can find it on Google pretty easily and, and and check yourself and see the lakes that you're interested in. What is the range of ice out date on those lakes? They will all be earlier in the southern part of the state because it's just a lot of warmth, a lot more warmth than the northern part. Um, but whether the variation is as broad, I don't know. I, I can give one other piece of information. I used to work on lakes in Iowa, working on those problems of greening of lakes and stuff. And when I, um, you know, if you go back about um, to the 19, 1980s and 90s, lakes in Iowa were freezing routinely. And now they sometimes just don't freeze. They're what we call polymictic. And, you know, so something has happened in the range of uh, ice out, ice out in quotes dates to the point that they don't even ever get ice. So, mm. um, yeah, so we're... Um, yeah, I think it's probably so, but I'm not. Yeah, I I just haven't analyzed the data. Hmm. George C. would like to know how does early or late ice out affect fish population? Ah. Um. You know, I was talking. Um, I was talking yesterday to John Latimer at KAXE. And um, and he was saying that the projections, you know, forecasts we're making of pretty late ice out are lined up with his other observations of phenology. Now, my current work isn't in fisheries biology, although I was trained in fisheries. Um, but my guess is, and some of our fisheries staff could probably tell you, if you lose, um, you lose ice the signals get different, right? And I'm, my guess is that you may so, see some variation in, mm -hmm. in spawning dates and so on. But, um, you know, I don't know directly, but I, but it, but George, it makes sense. It makes sense that there would be an effect. The other thing that'll happen with fish is, of course, as soon as you have ice out, then you get oxygenation of all, you know, the, the lake mixes, right? And mm -hmm. then you get oxygen mixed through the lake, you get different, and the surface waters are warmer, the fish don't have to be hiding in the cold part of, you know, the deep part of the lake anymore, and they'll begin to move more around the, uh, move into the shallows. Um, you know, I, I, I can, um, if you want to send me an email, I'll ask uh, Don Schreiner on the Minnesota Sea, and, and Amy Schrank on the Minnesota Sea Grant staff, if they have an opinion on it, just drop me an email and I'll, I'll, I'll get the real current fisheries people to give you a response. Fantastic. Next question, where on the lake does ice melt first and why? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so you'll get puddles out in the middle of lakes as ice begins to melt if you get intense sun. Um, <laughs> but where the melt really happens is near the shore. It, it really tends to melt fastest near the shore. And you build up what's called a shore lead, which is you no longer can jump onto the ice if you're foolish enough to do that. Um, you know, you get a space between the shore and the ice. And the, the why on that is um, that you have runoff coming in around the, around the shore. You also have a warmth that will come out of the um, sediments underlying, um, underlying the ice. Um, and in some lakes, and I think this is true in a lot of the lakes in that I know about in um, Itasca counties, you'll get groundwater flow that comes in nearest the shore that will tend to melt away the ice. Now, groundwater um, uh, temperature is about at the average annual temperature of the air. I mean, that's a kind of a rule of thumb. So the average annual temperature of the air is um, above freezing, even in Minnesota. And so that water is relatively warm compared to the ice. So a lot of things combine together. You get uh, water coming in, you get, uh, well, also, uh, as soon as you get a little bit of a shore lead, an open place, then the sun will be able to hit that dark surface underneath 
and warm yeah. up the water that's there and will melt away. And then what happens is that entire ice sheet will get kind of mobile and move around. And as soon as it right. does that, it starts to crack and make fractures and run up and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, yeah, around the edge, um, mostly, which means yeah. if you've got a lot of snow around the edge, well, if you've got a lot of insulation, we got to melt before we get ice out. This next question kind of touches on what we we're talking about with Milax. Why do we see ice pushing up on shore around ice out? Yeah, um, it gets broken up. It gets picked up by the wind, and um, uh, and the wind. Um, this is this is way nerdy stuff, but um, whatever the the um, wind speed is, you put about three percent of that wind speed into the ice, right? So you translate. So you're moving the ice at um, a, at something less than the velocity of the um, uh, the speed of the wind, and and of course it's going to move toward the opposite, sh you know, the 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 downwind shore. So it's going to hit the shore, and it's got a ton of power in it. It is, I don't know if you've ever watched that ice come up on a shore. Um, I, I suspect you have, since you're asking the question. Don't get in its way. It is heavy, and it is powerful, and it's mostly being driven by by wind. And it will build up really big banks um, and pretty much take out all um all infrastructure around around the shore when it gets going and uh it's just relentless when you get the the right wind exposure on it okay well then follow up on that is what makes all the noise when the ice when the ice starts to thaw yeah it's it, i actually i have some of those recordings linked on the on the web they're really fun mm. to listen to and i love that 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 sort of thrumming sound that you get when the ice is beginning to thaw. Um, and that is basically expansion and contraction of the ice sheet. And in some places, I know this sounds really far fetched, but I, I can give you the documentation on this. The expansion of the ice has been so much that it, it causes um, a, a something called an ice quake. Um, and uh, and what it'll do is it can actually be picked up on a seismograph because the ice expands against the shore and it will buckle and crack and it'll make that big booming kind of sound as it breaks but also that booming can be at such a low frequency and so loud that it will actually be picked up on a seismograph so sure. and then there are other sounds that i really like there's that i love that jingly sound that you get when uh, you get candle ice and the ice is beginning to you know wash up on shore and yeah but but uh, but the the thump the thumping and and booming uh, kinds of sounds are expansion, contraction. You'll hear them in the uh, as the ice warms up and then as it cools back down again in the evening. You know, talk about geeking out. I remember back with uh, seeing a show on uh, making a Star Wars. To George, George Lucas went out and actually did a digital sampling of the sounds of just those sounds you were talking about on uh, the ice on the lake. Oh, so. man. Yeah, for I don't know what blaster was used for, but anyway, Tom C asks, could you talk about how the ice takes on a vertical structure near ice out? Sure, a little bit. Um, it's it's an area I don't know quite as much about, but it has a vertical structure already uh, when it is frozen and before it starts to melt. Um, and so you get an initial layer of ice at the top of, and then atop of a lake, and then it begins to freeze from the bottom of that ice downward. And because there isn't much uh, wind energy or current or anything, it forms beautiful crystals that make these kind of long crystalline structures that are there, but you don't see them uh, until they begin to melt out. And then they melt out and they make that candle ice. You can see some crystalline structure and so on. And so the black ice, is in beautiful crystal form and it will it'll form kind of long uh needles of ice and that's what makes that jingling sound of course um and then it will just crack and buckle and and mm. you'll get um you know you'll get ice flows and and other pieces that break off and things they call bergy bits that are small icebergs we get in lakes and pancake ice and a bunch of mm. other broken up pieces well, John, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you, everyone, for questions. And and uh, John, I'm turning this back to you now. Well, thank you, Bill, and thanks, Jan, for doing the background. I 
I so much appreciate it. And I, I hope it's been useful and interesting to you. And um, we're going to put a video, put this recorded video up on the uh, Sea Grant website and link it also to itascawaters.org uh, practical water wisdom page. Um, so if you want to look at things again or have friends you'd like to uh, uh, have learned something about ice, then please um, uh, share uh, share this information with them. And I sure have appreciated your help here. The most important part of anything like this is you, uh, the listener, who get the information and uh, and hopefully use it or, or at least find it interesting. I really appreciate your time here. I want to thank um, again, I want to thank Bill and Jan I want to, uh, for their help today with the Q&A. I want to thank Chad Manneke, who has kept everything running in the background, and uh, and also um, other members of uh, Minnesota Sea Grant and itascawaters.org, the Itasca Waters Group, for their support and interest. So thank you all, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and get ready for that next snowstorm.